how a new debt justice law could help tackle the global debt crisis. I'm Zach, a campaigner at Debt Justice. In this video, I'll explore the way debt has been weaponized against lower income countries and communities for decades. By following the history of debt from colonialism to present day, I'll expose how it's both a legacy and an extension of colonialism, and how communities have resisted and struggled against the injustices for decades. So let's dive in. Right now, 54 countries are in debt crisis. This isn't an accident. It's a consequence of the way our economy has been designed over decades. When we talk about lower income country debt, it can sometimes be seen as a very technical and complex issue, something for The Economist to sort out. Or perhaps we might even see it as the fault of irresponsible borrowing by governments. But what is often missed in the mainstream narratives is the way that debt is used as a tool of power. More specifically, we miss how rich countries, corporations and institutions use debt as a tool to control and steal the resources of lower income countries, serving to keep themselves powerful and rich in a post-colonial context. If we're going to talk about debt as a colonial tool, we should probably start with colonialism. So what exactly is it? European colonial expansion began in the 1500s and continued into the 1900s. It involved European countries such as Britain, Portugal and Spain taking control of people and land across the Americas, Caribbean, Africa and Asia, often using violence and force. Colonial powers benefited greatly from the wealth and labour they exploited and extracted, while communities suffered horrendous harms from enslavement and violence to the erasure of traditional indigenous practices and languages. Despite the harms they faced, local and indigenous communities fought against European control, with many achieving independence by the 1970s. But for many countries, their journey of independence was not easy. Some countries became independent already saddled with debt, either forced to pay for their independence like Haiti, or forced to inherit the debts that colonial rulers had racked up while in power, like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let's look at Haiti as a case study. Haiti was occupied by Christopher Columbus in 1492 on behalf of the monarchs of Spain. Through massacre, enslavement and disease, Columbus and his men killed the vast majority of indigenous Taino people. 200 years later, the French seized Haiti and transformed it into a vast sugar, coffee and cotton plantation. The country became the world's richest colony off the back of forced labour of over 800,000 enslaved peoples trafficked from West Africa. Decades of resistance led to the first successful revolution by self-liberated enslaved people. The Republic of Haiti, the world's first black post-colonial republic, was officially declared in 1806. Fearful of Haiti's victory inspiring other colonies, France offered to recognize Haiti's independence, but only for the sum of $21 billion in today's terms. And with 14 French ships carrying 500 cannons pointing in Haiti's direction, Haiti's president was forced to agree. To meet the cost of independence, Haiti was forced to borrow from French, American and German banks. This independence debt locked the country in a century-long debt trap while Western leaders reaped the profits. Through debt, France had found a new way to maintain its position of power over Haiti. Meanwhile, the vast amounts Haiti had to spend on repayments massively outstripped the budget available to spend on education, healthcare and infrastructure. Now, Haiti has one of the lowest socio-economic statuses in the hemisphere with high levels of inequality. You may have seen the country in the news recently as it continues to struggle with high levels of violence and instability. The country is also extremely vulnerable to climate-related disasters like tropical storms. These disasters have not only taken tens of thousands of lives in the last few decades, but also threatened to pile on even more debt. Groups across Haiti have been demanding an end to the unjust debt they are being forced to pay, with many making links to Haiti's independence debt and the current conditions they face. 
There's also been strong demands for reparations for the suffering inflicted by slavery and colonization. Many other countries were forced to go into debt very quickly after independence, having inherited weak economies that had been plundered and transformed by European powers to suit their own interests, rather than the interests of the local communities. While some leaders, such as Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso and Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, did try to resist the power and control of former colonial rulers after independence. Many were left with little choice but to borrow. Rich Western governments, banks and institutions were able to keep their power, but this time as lenders. The benefits for them have been stark. They have maintained their position of power in the global system. They have used lending to exert power and influence over countries and they have extracted trillions of dollars of wealth through interest payments. In fact, lower income countries have spent over $2.2 trillion in interest payments alone on their loans from Western lenders since 1970. As a result of irresponsible lending by Western governments and institutions, debt levels across lower income countries grew exponentially in the 1970s. Lenders were irresponsible, so much so that when economic shocks rocked the global economy in the early 1980s, many of these countries could no longer repay their debt and began to default. You might think that debt cancellation would have been a fair response to the 1980s debt crisis, given that lower income countries were dependent on borrowing in large part because of these colonial legacies. But you can imagine this is not what happened. Rather than debt cancellation, Western-dominated institutions, in particular the International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, and the World Bank stepped in and provided more loans to countries in distress so they could keep repaying their lenders. The lenders were bailed out while low-income countries were pushed further into debt. But history has shown us that breaking this cycle is possible. In the late 1990s, a powerful movement in the Global South emerged called the Jubilee Campaign. It demanded complete debt cancellation by the year 2000 and for the inequalities in the debt system to be fixed to prevent unsustainable debt levels building up again. Within a matter of years, the campaign had become global with millions of people supporting these demands around the world. As a result, $130 billion worth of debt was cancelled, freeing up resources at a national level that could instead be spent on healthcare, education, and other vital needs across global South countries. But unfortunately, without fixing the broken system that caused debt in the first place, countries will continue to take on more loans. The Jubilee campaign's demand to fix the debt system when ignored. And so, debt levels have been able to build up to unsustainable levels once again, exacerbated by the multiple crises that countries are experiencing right now. There are now 54 countries in debt crisis. And just like in the 1980s and 90s, these countries are stuck relying on the same Western-dominated institutions to resolve it. So let's look at this a little closer through the experience of Ghana. Ghana gained independence from British colonial rule in 1957 under the leadership of Ghanaian president and revolutionary Kwame Nkrumah. But like many other countries, it inherited a weak economy, reliant on the export of gold, coca and oil making it vulnerable to economic shocks. Ghana quickly became dependent on borrowing from former colonial powers to keep afloat. Both the debt crisis and the IMF reforms are causing significant harms for the people of Ghana. As Bernard Anaba from the Integrated Social Development Centre, who are fighting against Ghana's unjust debt, tells us. But Ghana has not been able to add any value and generate more jobs for Ghanaians, uh, straight from the farms for exports. And it's also because we don't have the resources in terms of financing to add value. So basically, 
the colonial system has ensured that we produce our resources to feed industries in Western countries. The debt crisis has led to high cost of living, escalating food prices, high cost of uh, transportation as well, high cost of water and electricity, and making life very difficult for people. Uh, people barely go through two meals a day without compromising on their nutrition. So it's really a very difficult situation now. Lives are being destroyed because of the debt crisis. People in Ghana have been taking to the streets, protesting against the impacts of the debt crisis they're experiencing. In 2023, Ghana stopped paying its lenders and requested debt relief by a process set up by the G20, a self-selecting group of powerful, mostly Western countries. Sound familiar? But so far, no agreements have been reached. Over 60% of Ghana's upcoming debt payments are to private lenders, but the G20 have not put anything in place to ensure that these private lenders participate in debt relief. Instead of holding lenders accountable, the G20 are perpetuating a system where rich big banks, hedge funds and oil traders can block, stall and delay negotiations, effectively keeping countries trapped in debt crisis for their own benefit. These lenders could make billions if repaid in full by countries like Ghana. Once again, colonial power dynamics are replayed as Western lenders are benefiting, while countries and people in lower income countries are the ones paying the price. But you can help. As 90% of debt contracts are governed by UK law, it's essential we stand with protesters in Ghana and put pressure on our government to force private lenders to cancel the debt. We need a new debt justice law to start unraveling some of the unjust power dynamics inherent in the debt system and its colonial past. As always, if this video has brought up any questions, feel free to email us and we'll be happy to discuss them. We've also written a briefing where you can learn more about debt and colonialism. Find it at debtjustice.org.uk forward slash colonialism.